everyone. I think we could start now our uh, our event, uh, our third topic, our third talk that we uh, that uh, that is held as a part of our talk series. Uh, this talk series is about reconstructing cities and communities uh, after urbicide in Ukraine and. Uh, Today, we are going to talk about communities in particular. Uh, my name is Mariana Tsirko. I'm a researcher from uh, National Art Museum of Ukraine, which is one, uh, which is one of uh, the partner of the stock series. And uh, also, I would like to mention that uh, all our talks are, record, are recorded. So if uh, you miss the previous ones, or if you uh, couldn't uh, see this one till the end, don't worry, because uh, all these uh, recordings are saved on the YouTube page uh, of museum, and uh, also you can watch it later. And uh, now I would like to pass uh, the word to Svetlana Shripchenko, who will present our speakers uh, and also uh, say uh, a little more about uh, the specificity of uh, our talk today. Ah, thank you, Mariana. I am really pleased to participate in today's discussion. And I think uh, uh, to put proper questions or to put question or start uh, asking questions is perhaps more important uh, than to come up with the ready made answers. I think uh, the important questions we will be addressing to our speakers and perhaps to ourselves in current situation uh, will be um, like the following, which I put myself down. You perhaps can then discuss it again, but um, uh, we entered the process, um, actually we entered the process of rebuilding or recovery in the state of war. So is it a right time to do that? Or should we wait until the war ends and then start this way of recovery? Uh, then to recover, we have to have this kind of idea of the future we will be facing and a future of the cities and of the communities. But do our hermadas and communities have this common vision? Do the common vision, or do they share this common vision of the future? Rebuilding. Um, what conflicts could we face on this road of recovery? Uh, on which principles could we build the solidarity of our future communities and hermadas? Because of the solidarity, to me, is the principal thing and the principal value. Uh, on which we have to build up, to build on. Um, can we like, imagine this future community or future Hermada because everything is in a very unstable sta state and everything is changing? Who is in charge of uh, um, research? Who, who is researching the situation in our country? And um, Today we have two speakers, uh, and I'm really pleased to uh, introduce Eric Hurti, who is a professor of political and cultural sociology at uh, the University College London, and Maria Krishinka, who is a researcher at the Center for Urban Studies, and currently she is affiliated at Lviv Center for Urban History, doing her research there. So please. We'll, we'll start uh, with Eric's presentation and then uh, Marie. Please. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Okay. Um, it's really a pleasure to, to, to be here. Um, I, was, I was only in Ukraine once in, in my life, but uh, um, but I still have the memento that I got when I was uh, when I was there, um, which is from uh, one of those big department stores in the center. And I got a um, and I got a fur hat, very nice in the winter, and it matches my dog. Um, so uh, so this is uh, this is one of the things I remember that that visit by. Um, 
what I want to do in this uh, in this talk, um, we're trying to keep this uh, as more of a dialogue than uh, than a standard presentation. Um, so uh, so what I have are some examples of things that have been done in terms of uh, um, of reconstruction or memorialization or the failure to reconstruct or uh, or memorialize in different parts of the former Yugoslavia where there was a series of wars in the in the 1990 that I think are emblematic of issues that are similar to the ones that are um, that are faced in other places. So to give some kind of uh, um, some kind of comparative basis. And what I'm going to do, I've got uh, four of these examples that I've prepared with some uh, with some pictures to show you and all of that. Um, and I'll spend a couple minutes uh, presenting one, and then uh, um, and then I think Mario will have some responses, and we'll uh, and we'll open up discussion, and and then we can go to uh, and then we can go to do uh, to do some more once we've uh, once we've discussed each one. Is that all right? Okay. Well, if so, let me share my screen um, so that uh, um, so that you can see the slides that I've prepared, and screen share. There we go. Um, and uh, um, do you uh, do you see the slide here? Yes. 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 Okay. Let me uh, let me move to the beginning. Uh, so this is the title page. I'm trying to offer some uh, um, some some comparative uh, notes. These hypotheses. I mean. You can certainly look at them. I put it at the beginning of the slideshow, but, um, but I don't want to talk about this now. Um, what I'd like to do is come back to it at the end and see whether where I thought we would end up would be where we end up. And instead, I want to go right to uh, to talking about the, the first case. Um, and this is one I think most people, if they know of only one instance of uh, um, of violence directed against cities in the wars in former Yugoslavia, they probably know about the Vietnita in uh, in Sarajevo. I mean, I think one of the things that uh, um, that I can say is that at least one of the hypotheses generally about explaining the violence in the wars is that much of the violence that uh, um, that was committed was violence directed against cities and against urban culture. I mean, not only because of the role of cities as a kind of representative place of, uh, um, of, the, of the nations or of the regions that were, uh, that were being attacked, but it's, also, uh, but it's also something that is specifically related to, uh, um, to nationalism and to, uh, and to nationalist ways of thinking, um, because the enemy of nationalism in these wars was very often uh, not the group that was being attacked, um, but the idea of cosmopolitan, of mixed communities, of which cities were emblematic. And cities are emblematic of this, at least partly because of the role of cities as repositories of culture. And this is why you saw so much violence directed against monuments of, uh, um, of culture, libraries, museums, uh, religious buildings and uh, and so on. And one of them is this building that you uh, that you see in the picture here. Um, so the Vietnica was built uh, in the 1890s uh, during the time when uh, when Bosnia and Herzegovina was administered by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, and you can see from the style, this is a style that was popular in the period. So a lot of the public buildings built by the uh, um, by the Habsburg Empire in this style, the, the Moorish style. Um, so it's uh, it's meant to bring in elements of uh, um, of Orientalist nostalgia, and it was built to be the center of the city government, which it was until 1949. Uh, from 1949 onward, this building um, was the uh, was the site of the National Library and of the University Library. Um, so this is a library that was well used, right? I mean, both by by the public and by uh, um, and by researchers from the university, and it held many important archives, in particular archives from the period of the uh, of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and it is also, as I think you can probably see from uh, um, from the photo, um, one of the main attractive attractions in in the city. That is a uh, um, a recognizable destination building. Um, early in the war, this is one of the buildings that was. Uh, 
that was attacked in August of 1992. Um, so it was attacked with uh, with mortar shells from positions held by the Bosnian Serbs in the hills above the city. Um, and uh, here is a picture of the fire that resulted from that shell attack. And this fire resulted in, I mean, it was a dramatic event. Um, there are scenes of the librarians from the library running into the fire to rescue as many of the bits of the archive as they were, uh, as they were able to rescue, but still large parts of the collection were destroyed. That is to say, large parts of the local history um, were destroyed. And I would say that this particular attack on a public building, I mean, a public building that is also a repository of national memory, is regarded by uh, um, in a lot of people globally, and I think also a lot of people in Sarajevo as an iconic moment of the war, as the moment representing um, the um, the, the thesis that people were attacking our history, our identity, our culture, our memory. Um, when there were anti-government riots in, uh, in 2014, a group of riot rioters um, also set fire to another building, not a monumental building, but it was a building um, where much of the archive that had been rescued from this library was destroyed. And this turned enormous parts of the public against the uh, um, the protesters. They uh, they did not want to be reminded of uh, um, of this moment, which was traumatic for them. Uh, so the building was destroyed. It was a priority when the war ended to reconstruct the building. Um, so it was restored. It was reopened in, in 2014, um, not as the National and University Library again. That was moved to another uh, to a, another location. Um, but it is a ceremonial building. Um, there is a hall for ceremonial events. There is exhibit space. Uh, concerts are uh, are held there, and so on. Um, so it is a cultural site. And what you see in the photo here, um, on many days of the year, the facade of the building has uh, has different lights and colors and images projected on it that are meant to be a representation of significant uh, elements in the in the momentary consciousness of the city. Um, so when there is a prominent international visitor, um, then the uh, the facade will be done up in the flag of the country where the visitor is from. On, uh, um, on the day of the Pride March, they do it in the rainbow colors. Uh, they celebrate cultural events, sports victories here. And in the photo here, this is taken earlier this year, um, you see the, uh, um, the building done up in the colors of, uh, um, of, of Ukraine. So, uh, um, so this is what the building is used for. And uh, I mean, with this, let me, uh, um, let me stop sharing the slide now. This is as much as I'll say about this event. And I'll just say, um, this is probably the most traditional of, uh, of all of the examples that I will show you, right? That is, um, it is a site that was an important site uh, for memory and identity before the war. Its attack is, uh, is memorialized as a meaningful representation of the war, and it was rebuilt to, uh, to retake that role with an added layer of meaning. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Eric. And uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, my name is Maria, and uh, it's really a pleasure for me to take part in this uh, discussion. Um, from the very beginning, I can say that I'm sorry for my English. I will try my best uh, now. And um, and um, uh, what is also important uh, for me that uh, most of things that I can tell today, it's more like speculative thoughts based on um, work that I'm doing now and, and now I'm working on documentation of the war in Ukraine and uh, I'm still uh, uh, working uh, on uh, uh, on my field research so now I have not so much uh, like analytical results and um, but in any case just I think that uh, but it's important uh, it's important uh, to have uh, discussions like this because uh, in any cases um, answering as Svetlana's uh, questions and when when it's time to start i think that uh, it's time to start uh, when uh, uh, when you have resources to do this and yeah now that's what i'm working on and thinking that it is what scholars can do now in ukraine 
Um, yeah, thank you for this uh, first case. And I think that it's important uh, uh, important to say that uh, we have uh, we have great examples uh, of uh, of uh, such uh, destruction in Ukraine. Yeah, and uh, um, probably all of you know uh, that uh, from uh, very beginning, from the first uh, first uh, days after twenty fourth of February, we have. Uh, we have destruction and uh, the bombing on the universities, and it was what was uh, one of the first cases, the university in Kharkiv, that was uh, the symbol of um, of intelligence of Kharkiv, and it was uh, it was bombed and uh, partially destroyed, and it's really um, I think that it's really a great struggle on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's great honor that. Uh, the, the the lectors the the, the people who worked uh, in uh, in Kharkiv University they decided that they uh, they need to stay as a university in Kharkiv and not moving to other cities and it's also somehow the symbolical uh, symbolical way to tell that we are fighting and we are not uh, um, we won't start and uh, um, this is our land and uh, we will fight for that. And also we have a lot of cases with bombing of uh, museums, so for example, the Museum of Skavarada. And uh, uh, this is a really crucial case because Skavarada is the key Ukrainian uh, philosopher. And I can say that uh, mm, uh, this, this, uh, this example, how local community, how local community uh, trying, uh, trying, uh, to to save to save this uh, uh, exposition from uh, uh, from uh, from the museum was uh, really impressed. Also, we have uh, cases of bombing Mikolaev University. Yeah, and uh, uh, this is also the main the, the the really important university in the region. And uh, the, if we will uh, uh, watch on uh, the events that going on last. Um, Last month, we have uh, uh, attack uh, on the Kiev National University, the symbol of academia in this uh, uh, in this country, and also it's quite near with the monument of Taras uh, Shevchenko and uh, and uh, Mikhail Khrushchevsky, who was the first uh, the first uh, uh, president of uh, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian Republic. So this is quite uh, very important. Uh, very important um, a statement that we can say that this is uh, the, the destruction of the community starts uh, from uh, a destruction of the culture, yeah, and uh, for destroying from very beginning of the culture. And also, um, if we will talk about gramadas and communities under occupation, we can observe a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, criminals and uh, a lot of. Um, a lot of situation when uh, school teachers uh, were killed. And this is also just because they are school teachers of uh, Ukrainian language or Ukrainian or Ukrainian history. Yeah, but and if you know in the in the in the small cities or in the villages, the teacher is really important person in a community. So this is the person who provides this social uh, social tears in communities, and 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 we have uh, we have this situation with the uh, that a lot of a lot of teachers were killed or imprisoned. Uh, um, yeah. And this is what 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 Russians started uh, uh, from uh, in the on, on, during the occupation. They started from uh, um, uh, from from um, uh, uh, from uh, from school, and they started uh, from the um, uh, opportunities, how they say, or but. Uh, started from uh, doing the Russian school, yeah, and Russian classes for 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 children, and they started uh, to taught uh, Russian history. And uh, for 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 me as a sociologist, what I'm thinking about this is that um, what 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 can we do in this situation, and how we will um, how we will. Uh, um, work uh, you know, 
with the with the with the people who was under occupation, with these children who got this trauma, uh, who got uh, uh, get this traumatic traumatic experience on the one hand, but on the other hand, we need to be inclusive and. Uh, mm, yeah, so this is the question, what we will do uh, after the occupation and uh, how we can be inclusive for these people who was under occupation, for the children, and uh, also um, there, there will be a lot of uh, questions uh, about uh, this really cultural issues, how we can, uh, how we can uh, make this uh, conversation and dialogue in these Hermagas. Yeah, so thank you very much. It's fast, uh, uh, fast thoughts based on this case. And also I have uh, some other my cases, but I think that I will show it uh, after your, uh, your cases. Yeah. Okay, um, are there, are there other people who, uh, who want to, uh, who want to discuss this before we, we go on to the next case? Uh, hello, uh, I'm Katerina Goncharova, and I'm working at WMF as Ukrainian Heritage Crisis Specialist. And, you know, everything you've, you've talked about is just really, just literally um, looks pretty much the same to the case we're now investigated, investigating in uh, Chernigiv. Probably we've heard about this library of use previously, the M U Museum of Ukrainian Antiquities that was bombed during the first month of, of the war. Uh, this building became notorious and, and significant, wide known only because it was actually bombed because previously it was seen as a, a monument of local significance and pretty much not that many visitors were coming there, but since the, the building was bombed, there was a, a, a lot of, of attention that this building and this ruins attracted. So when we, uh, got, when we finally got to Chernigiv, we found out that there's, there are a lot of stakeholders and a lot of potential partners who would like to do the job, but there are no, no local community who would like to, it to be done. First of all, because of demographic uh, issues, there are a lot of people left, and so, and there's no there is no task force of locals who would like the building to be reconstructed. Uh, therefore, since there's a bazillion of, of again international organizations like my fund, like uh, Prince Klaus Foundation, like uh, even. Even Kiev folks would like this building to, to be um, rehabilitated, but we have a very, very minimal support from the locals. Again, they do not, for now, of course, everyone is preparing to the winter. And we, we're thinking about at least for now, we, we're in the project of winterizing this building, meaning securing the site from the damage caused by external factors like precipitation, cold, and things like this. But we're looking forward for midterm and long-term project. And we had to um, reject the idea of community engagement and values assessment and anything like that, that would actually engage the local communities and local stakeholders simply because there's no one to talk to. And those people do not realize they're facing so many challenges right now, just basic survival. If they should come home, is it safe enough? Uh, what to do with children, how they will educate, and things like this, they're piling up and there's no room for cultural heritage in their minds, in their, in their picture of the world. Therefore, we're thinking uh, right after this project, we're uh, we going to launch a project on urgent stabilization that would literally seal the building and prevent any negative like pr progress of any destruction but we definitely need to postpone anything that has something to do with local community engagement because no one knows how the building can be used in the future. No one knows who will be the users of the site. No one knows the ideas and the values that they will comprehend through using, using of this building. Therefore, um, this is quite different. And, and I particularly noticed the, the time distance 
in this in the case that you showed from Sarajevo, because the building was destroyed in what 1992 and yeah. reconstructed in 2014. So they had a lot of time to think about the necessity of this building, about potential use, about potential occupiers of this place, about everything. So, but we do not have this time. So this was my reflection on this. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Katya. And also, um, I also have this, uh, but I think that we will, uh, um, I will share it in the end. This is uh, uh, also have these questions uh, how we can how we can do this, yeah, and when it's important to start, and also what about public participation? Yeah, because there are so much uh, uh, now in Ukraine, there are so much initiatives uh, that somehow deal with the uh, with the rebuilding, reconstruction. Um, uh, but uh, and 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 the, the public participation is uh, like the key issue or uh, the, the the key principle that uh, that we have in these initiatives. It's even we have this uh, in our plan of uh, reconstruction uh, of Ukraine. Yeah, the public participation. But this is really the question: how to do this? When we can do this, and who can be involved, or heck, who may be involved? Yeah, and what what results do we have in the end? And I think that this is really important question that we also can talk uh, can talk about uh, um, in the end. Yeah, and where to find this uh, community that can be interested in 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 the reconstruction? Because I'm totally agree when you have every day. Uh, bombing in your city or alarms or um, problems with electricity with a school where and there are a lot of questions this is really maybe not uh, not the time when you can can be engaged and this is not really about uh, the, the, the 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 good quality of uh, process of public participation but this is really important question that also we can talk uh, talk today yeah to, to again to, to wrap up Mar Maria's comment, I would say that all of this calls for public participation in all of legal uh, governmental or local strategies are pretty much end up with declaration because there is no means and no instrument to conduct this rule for the moment. It's true, too sensitive. But yet again, we're talking about those areas that are were liberated or in a close proximity to the battlefields. We had pretty excellent project in Lviv, where I actually saw Maria for the last time. It was really excellent because the community was really engaged. They all wanted to take place, to take part. They all were really, really fantastically responsive. Um, maybe because of, again, there are too many people in Lviv right now, and they're all looking for some positive cases, some positive precedents to concentrate on, except for this horrible dystopian scenarios that we're all living in. So it's it's so different. Maybe, uh, maybe I can say another thing about reconstruction, and that is that uh, the, the reconstructing um, cultural sites is always a uh, field for contestation. Um, so if we want to talk about religious sites in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, religious sites were frequently attacked, um, especially mosques. And, uh, and in most of the places where mosques were destroyed, there was a desire to, to rebuild them. Now, the thing about mosques in Bosnia and Herzegovina is that the historical mosques were built in the Ottoman style. That is with the round dome and the relatively small buildings. They are intimate spaces. Most of the financing for uh, um, for building spaces to replace them comes from the states on the Arabian Peninsula, um, where they build them in, diff in a different style. They build the big square ones that are much much larger. So Saudi Arabia is very happy to finance reconstruction of a mosque, but they won't finance construction of the traditional Ottoman style. They will finance the construction of, uh, um, of these big box style ones. And this is related to disputes over um, you know, what international actor will be powerful enough to exercise control over religious and, uh, and cultural life. So, so this is another place where there is dispute Yeah, it's uh, it's really a very uh, 
impressive story about not about the community not willing to participate, and uh, we can understand the reasons why. And uh, um, I think we can proceed to the next Eric's example and then discuss it like okay. the following. Eric comes up with the, uh, his example, and Maria reflects, and then we call for audience to react. Okay, so I think it's it. so. Then let me go back to the screen sharing, and um, let's see. And the next uh, slide. Uh, okay, so this is. Uh, um, this is a city in Croatia, Vukovar. Um, so Vukovar is uh, is in Slavonia, a part of Croatia that uh, um, that borders with the the northern part of uh, of Serbia, with uh, with with Vojvodina. And uh, this whole region was a uh, um, was a mixed region. It was a relatively prosperous region um, in. Uh, in relation to uh, to the the rest of Yugoslavia, and when the wars began, I mean, it was contested, in the sense that uh, um, that you had both uh, um, ethnic Serb and ethnic Croat forces trying to establish control and with paramilitaries, um, but there was also a very very strong movement of resistance to violence. The uh, um, the chief of police in the area around Osijek, which is nearby, is uh, um, is kind of a legendary figure. This was uh, Josip Reichel Kier. And Josip Reichel Kier, I mean, he was the head of a small police force, but when uh, when battles were starting and paramilitaries would start fighting each other in villages, he would just rush over wherever battles were starting and negotiate a peace agreement between uh, on the local level between the people there. And, uh, and he said, as long as I am the chief of police, the war is not going to come to this part of the country. And the paramilitaries agreed and determined that he should not be chief of police. Um, so very early during the war, he was murdered, and uh, um, and this area became one of the highly contested sites. Um, Vukovar is one of the three large cities in uh, um, in Slavonia um, that became one of the most contested. That is, both the Serbian and Croatian sides. Um, decided that it was absolutely vital to their interest that they had to control it, um, and so uh, and so there was a battle for control of Vukovar that uh, um, that went on over three months, and this was a battle in which really no part of the city was uh, was untouched. Um, really, there is major destruction in every street in the city. And if you go there now, you will still see, I mean, there has been a lot of reconstruction, but you will still see evidence of construction in, uh, um, in, in, every, in every street. I mean, I suppose uh, I immediately thought about Vukovar when we started hearing about, uh, um, about the, uh, um, the, the takeover of, of Mariupol. Uh, so, I mean, it is really, it is not possible to uh, to overstate the extent of the destruction in Vukovar. And as a result, it's taken a special role, especially in public memory in Croatia. Um, almost every uh, larger town or city in Croatia will have a street or a square uh, named for uh, um, for Vukovar, sometimes for the heroes of Vukovar. Um, it takes a special place in the national rhetoric as a city of victims, and some people call it a place of special piety, um, a place that uh, that is accorded special special memory, uh, and so should have a status different from other cities. And this is a reason why I think um, much of the activity in Vukovar is uh, is contested. So first of all, there is disagreement about whether to restore. Um, sites and uh and and places and properties that have been damaged or to leave the damage standing as uh um as an ongoing reminder of uh um of the destruction that uh, that was caused so these two photos here that you can see i mean one of them is a destroyed house and as you can see they uh they compromised between leaving it uh, leaving it damaged and restoring it they left the damage to the building but put some flower boxes in the uh um in the windows 
the photo that you see on the right side is the water tower that was uh, very extensively destroyed, became, uh, um, became almost unusable. And for years, it was local policy in the, um, in the city to leave the destroyed water tower standing. Um, as, uh, as a reminder of this time of intense destruction. Um, a few years ago, um, this, this policy was changed. So if you go there now, you would not see the destroyed water tower that is there in the picture. It, is, uh, um, it has been restored, um, both in its appearance and in its function. Um, so it is being used to store water. Um, I'll tell you another thing about Vukovar, though, and I've got just one more slide to show you about Vukovar. Um, and that is, it is a city of mixed population. That is, before the war began, the population was about two thirds ethnic Croat, about one third um, ethnically, uh, ethnically Serbian. Um, and it was a place where there were not intensive conflicts on the basis of nationality, not until the war. Um, but for a time, the territory where the city was was controlled by Serb forces, and then there was expulsion of the uh, Croat population. When it was retaken by uh, um, by Croatia, there was a large scale ex ex expulsion or um, departure of the ethnic Serb population, some of whom are coming back, not in the numbers that existed before the war, but in meaningful numbers, meaningful enough that uh, um, that they have their own uh, um, their own school programs and uh, um, and so on. Another thing that I'll tell you about Vukovar is it was the major center of industry and trade locally. Um, so really an industrial city and the industries included things like uh, um, like textiles, shoes. Um, in, uh, in the 1920s or perhaps it was the 30s already, um, it was the site of a big factory that was built by the Bata Shoe Company. This uh, um, this Czech uh, shoe company that was built according to the vision of the uh, the social capitalists of uh, um, of that period. So it was the factory that was uh, um, where the workers lived and had educational and cultural events related to uh, to the factory. Work was a big part of of the city. Work is not a big part of the city now. Most of the people who live there are unemployed. Um, and one of the things that uh, that maintains them is that uh, is that the state of Croatia politically um, maintains a very, very strong interest in veterans in supporting veterans. And as a result, veterans get very generous pensions, it's enough money to live on. As a result of this, there are many, many more veterans in Croatia than there ever were people who served in the armed forces of Croatia during the war. Um, so these are people whose existence and uh, um, sufficiency is tied to the symbolic importance of their role in a national conflict. And these photos that I'm showing you now um, are uh, from a moment of failed reconciliation. Um, officially, Serbian and Croatian in the law in Croatia are two separate languages. And for a long time, all public signs um, were written only in, uh, in Croatian. When the government decided, consistent with uh, the European Union uh, regulations on minority rights, that since there were two populations in the city with uh, legally different languages, that signs would have to be put up in both languages, they started putting up signs on public buildings. And what would happen was repeatedly, every morning, you would see somebody would put up the bilingual sign, um, people would crowd around it, they would destroy it, they would take it down, they would parade around the city with the, uh, with the destroyed sign, and the next day they would put up a new sign and, uh, um, and the same thing would happen. So what, uh, um, what all of these public spaces become then, and the representation of memory in public spaces are to the degree that memory places its accent on the character of conflict, or whether memory places its accent on the goal of reconciliation, um, what you see is constant performance of a mixed city with a mixed character um, in which memory is a recurring subject of contestation. And this contestation is performed in um, efforts to, uh, to control representation in visual space. Um, so that's as much as I will say about uh, Vukovar, the second example, and I'll stop the screen share. Uh, 
Yeah. Um, thank you very much, um, Eric. And um, what I think that it's um, also an important question um, for us, so based on this, uh, uh, based on uh, this example, and also um, somehow connected to our previous discussion. Um, what I, I I think that um, how we can this is important question how we can uh, keep this. Um, balance on uh, starting uh, starting uh, doing yeah because the first uh, um, our the, the first thought that appeared um, after uh, you know, dramatic uh, traumatic events is to do something yeah or to to reconstruct or build the memorial and um, other on the other hand, uh, how to to stay and keep this time for for thinking. What uh, what do we need to remember? Yeah, the violence, uh, our pain, or uh, our hope. Yeah, and uh, this is also an important question. That um, what I think that it's uh, important to do something. To create uh, uh, create the opportunity for 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 some hope for the better future, yeah. So this is important. In this case, it's important to start uh, to think about the future. And, uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's it's important uh, important uh, to do this first uh, first uh, first steps uh, from starting uh, talking about this about the future and about the, how we can provide this hope for the future. And I think that this good, good example based on this uh, can be this uh, the, in uh, in the ping. We have uh, already the several projects of uh, memorialization, yeah, of the of of uh, um, of the Hinnetset in Irpin, and we already have several projects, and there was no public talks about this, and now we can see a lot of discussions in social media about uh, about the project, about uh, the questioning: Do we need to have some um, architectural? Uh, um some architectural uh, contest or do we need to, to have this project there or who decide to have some memorial uh in the in the bridge and also we have other projects of memorialization and uh, um in in Rapin, uh, that will have uh, something like uh, like museum uh, in the area and this is like the examples when we start to doing something just to react on uh, on our on our pain on on our trauma, but this is um, the question: How, what can we do, and how we can stop and start thinking and talking about this? And also, I think also it's important, uh, uh, also important issues that Katya tell. It's what uh, what community can we engage, and who can be engaged in this. Mm, yeah, and we have some examples when, uh, and this is when when the local no, local authorities are starting to introduce some participatory practices for uh, discussing um, the, the, the the examples of um, uh, the the Russification. So this is somehow connected with the uh, with the monuments, uh, with the names uh, of our streets. But still, this is not really dialogue, and. Uh, mm, I think that if we if we, if we have no dialogue in the end we will get the same uh, results as on on your example that uh, uh, local activists or people who was disagree with the with the uh, with the decisions will uh, will act in other way and will show uh, their power uh, in the public spaces yeah so this is I think that is important questions how can we create the dialogue and how we can start talking and with whom and when, of course. But I think that the, the crucial here is the dialogue, how we can make decisions. And what can I say about Ukraine that we have really great experience in previous years, how we can start to think about our past, how we can discuss our past. And I think that the example of uh, memorialization of events on Maidan, it's really good example when uh, on the beginning of a project, 
um, everybody starts doing something to propose idea to to make something in a public space and it, it was important time to pro provide the ideas but then because there was so much ideas and all of them was so much controversial uh, the local authorities stopped and starting the this process of dialogue and there was a lot of uh, round tables when people just discuss their um, their thoughts about uh, the ideas of memorial, but also they discuss and they share their experience. And I think that for Katya and also what can be the beginning point, this is the dialogue for sharing the experience. Because I think that for Ukraine, it's also uh, can be the issue how we can create the dialogue between people who have different experience of war. Yeah, so we will have uh, the IDPs, we will have veterans, we will have people who moved uh, outside of Ukraine and then back. We will have people who stay in their cities. And this is this is, will be the issues, how we can create this dialogue and start talking first about our experience and then talking about our future or our past. Yeah, but I think that it somehow need to be need to be uh, organized in this way, not starting from the discussion about memorialization, but starting discussing more more broad uh, issues. It's about our sales, our identity, and our experience. Yeah, this is my comment. I'm sorry if it's not somehow it make it can be not connected to your example, but this uh, is what my thoughts. No, I mean, yeah, I I think it's very well connected because, uh, I mean, one of the things, if we want to talk about examples of failed memorialization, I think what all failed memorialization projects have in common is that they take as their starting point ideology instead of um, instead of people's social experience and shared understanding. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's bit because uh, I was a part of this process of uh, discussions of memorializations of Maidan. And actually, um, a very important part of it was information campaign or, you know, uh, lectures, presentations, and then discussing certain uh, approaches, certain ideas, and other things, uh, which people before were not aware uh, of absolutely, and then up all, on, uh, only after that, uh, they could uh, somehow formulate their ideas of how to memorialize of the approaches of the ideas uh, to this process of memorialization. This, I think, the information is also very important. And uh, if, uh, for example, is in it in this decommunization campaign, we didn't have much time, or um, not even much, we didn't have time to discuss or to um, put forward this information campaign. So now we can do that, showing different examples, showing different uh, cases, and of this failed memorialization, other things to people, uh, to the, for them to be aware of, of, you know, of the need of time to rethink and to really to uh, come to reconciliation and to understanding that they are here to live together. If they want to live together in this site, in this place, then they can, they should. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, the yeah. What can I add? And uh, yeah, this example with the uh, memorization of Maidan was was I think that it's a good example from Ukraine. Yeah, because we don't have so much good examples of. Eventually, no one it. went so far. No, no, no creating. Uh, yeah, and, and this is also the result. And but this the is result also the result. Is, yeah, yeah. We don't have conflicts. Yeah, but on the other hand, uh, today um, uh, we are um, like. We are still uh, in the situation of uh, traumatization and re-traumatization. Yeah, and this is also the question about the dialogue during uh, during the process when you have this uh, traumatic experience every day. Yeah, and uh, this is I have more like 
here I have more questions uh, than answers for sure. Uh, but I think that uh, it's important to start thinking about this on the level of, uh, first of all, of local communities and uh, um, local activists and communities and representatives of authorities who has resources to start doing this. Yeah, and maybe here can be the role of for academia who can also help uh, to provide this process for sure. Well, uh, I will add a little. I was absolutely amazed with this case uh, with two language, how do you call it? The signage of a certain places and the reaction of local communities. And from my perspective, it looks like, um, well, there's not that many international stakeholders who would have an experience on, on in working of those who had the, the experience of war, because war pretty much cancels all the normality. So this, this, this uh, roadmap, when you use the same cookie cutter to face any situation, to apply to any situation, simply doesn't work. Because people who had the experience of war, they're not normal. And every life, the life they live is not normal. There is no place for normality. Therefore, you need to work very sensitive, very, very sensitively with every one of them. And of, of course, those communities there that were directly affected, because this Vukovar reminds me a lot about suburbs of Kiev, Irpen, Bucha, and all of the sites that for now becomes so well known, uh, sadly. Um, and some people refuse to go back there because they say, I cannot go back to a concentration camp. I just can't. Uh, for example, one of the, the architects that I know whose project on preservation of St. Andrew's Church won um, the Europa Nostra Award as one of the most excellent projects of preservation. She was from Irpin and she said, I will not go back. I can't live through those memories one more time. It's just too painful. Therefore, this, this, so to speak, simple from, from outside perspective, simple signage in two languages would literally pull the trigger of re-traumatization. So from my perspective, it's just really, really, it, it's something that um, will stop it with me after this conversation and I will return to rethinking about one and one more time. <laughs> but there is another question, Katya. Once you know, uh, some people won't, will never return to this uh, site, but the other people uh, would love to live near Kiev, and uh, we mm. have this uh, displaced uh, persons mm. who need shelter, who need housing, and they will. And how will they live in this place, in this site? Um, this is another story. I think it it opens up more and more questions. Yeah, and so how I think it's uh, extremely. It's, uh, Maria has uh, pointed out extremely important uh, part uh, or role of academia and experts who need to pose these questions before. Yeah, and also this is the the, the 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 question how we can provide this uh, safe space uh, for people who decide to stay in their cities and uh, or who return to their cities and uh, safe space for creating uh, the, somehow the the, the 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 space of memory and share their experience uh, with others, but on the other hand, uh, really this is can, this is the truth that uh, we, we will have uh, the experience of uh, growing of some, some cities and other cities uh, uh, will be depopulized. And um, this is, uh, we will have a lot of, a lot of work uh, to do in this case. And yeah, but thank you, Katja. And I think that when, when we're thinking about Mariupol, yeah, it's too painful for me to talk about Mariupol, but, uh, I think that this is it, it can be the it, it will be there a lot of a lot of uh, uh, a lot of issues uh, to think about and the, the example of memorization 
or recreation, for example, of a theater. Yeah, so let's recreate the theater where, where so much people died. And, uh, and, and this is really important, important uh, question that we need to start uh, uh, to talking about this. Yeah, so for, first of all, the occupation, yeah, and uh, providing some uh, some opportunities uh, for uh, safe uh, safe talking about our experience and uh, not making uh, the, the 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 situation of retraumatization because of uh, of the experience that people have. But on the other hand, we have now a lot of uh, projects uh, on uh, theater from Mariupol. We also have uh, also have a lot of projects on vision for the future of Mariupol, and this work is uh, it's going on now. And this is the question: Why we starting do these projects, but not stopping and thinking? And I can say that my answer now is that all of us need the hope for a better future, but we can start on thinking, even providing ideas. But before starting to doing something, we need to stop and to think and then to talk. Yeah, this is my, I don't know, some chaotic reflection. Yeah, but there's also a master plan for Mari. Oopa yeah. designed by yeah. Yeah. developed by Russians in summer. Yeah, yeah. and there are but... and and this is also the question that there are a lot of information uh, that uh, based on the previous work that was done in Mariupol. So they use our mm -hmm. results of uh, researching the city because they was prepared for creating the master plan of a city before 24th of February. So there was a lot of work that was done by Ukrainian specialist experts, planners, mm -hmm. and they just translate it and then use it. But and they pretend a... that it's okay. But there is a question of justification. Who has the right to take the decision? Who takes yeah. the right to control the situation? Who takes the who has the right to you know to do whatever? Um, and giving the, the, the current situation, all the previous results of the research were about pre-war situation in the city, about pre-war uh, demographic, social networking, everything. But now everything had changed. We heard about this this thousands of people being murdered and things like this. So uh, I think, of course, I do share this, this thought that we all need to have some, some, not a dream, but at least a vision of the future that we can, can you know, uh, communicate through some projects. Um, if we think about this project for reconstruction of Mariupol theater and other significant sites that were damaged, like, restart Ukraine and all of those folks. This is all positive for me. It, it doesn't require anything like discussion and anything else, but at least gives some vision of the future, that its future is actually possible. Yeah. So I, I do share the thought and, and I'm in big favor of it. Okay, thank you, Katya. Can we get to the next example? Okay, yeah, Please. I mean, I'm, maybe before I get to it, one thing that I can mm -hmm. say is that um, in talking about these issues, I mean, especially people intervening from outside, it's very easy for them to forget how transformative violence is in the life of a community. Um, and particularly in the sense that after violence has happened, a lot of the intellectual and cultural energy in the community is going to be oriented toward that violence. And this is regardless of of whose energy it is. That is, some of this energy is directed toward documenting it or trying to understand it or explain it or commemorate it or memorialize it. Some of this energy is directed toward denying it or justifying it or celebrating it. But in any case, everybody's energy is directed toward violence. And uh, um, and it's too tempting to, to pretend that that's not the case. Um, but maybe having said that, let me go back to um the sides and um wait i think i'm showing you the wrong screen here sorry um let me uh let me try this again there we go um okay so the um 
the next example that I want to show you, we go back to Bosnia and Herzegovina here, is uh, um, is Priedor. Now Priedor is uh, um, it's another industrial town um, and a uh, and a town with uh, um, with mixed population, mostly uh, um, what were called uh, in the earlier period Bosnian Muslims, and who are now called Bosniaks and um, um, and and Serbs. And it's one of the towns where, um, I mean, the International Criminal Tribunal was asked to decide that the events in this uh, um, in this town during the war constituted genocide, and uh, and they did not. So legally. Um, there is still, according to the courts, only one instance of genocide in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and that was in Srebrenica, where after the uh, the conquest of uh, of the town by the Bosnian Serb army, uh, the male population was uh, was separated, and it's uh, um, and and the members of it uh, executed over the course of uh, of a bit more than a week. In Priedor, what you saw, um, this was uh, this was one of the only instances I think um, that we know of um, in which uh, practice was adopted that will be recognizable to people who have studied the history of the Second World War. Um, that is that the, uh, the Muslim residents of the town were required to fly white flags in front of their houses and to wear white armbands if they uh, if they left the houses with restrictions on their um, on their movement and uh, um, and so forth. So this is a dramatic uh, event of uh, um, of you know, visual representation of, uh, of 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 difference and um, and repression of uh, of a group which is still commemorated now yearly as uh, as White Armband Day on the anniversary of this decision going down. Uh, people will go and wear white armbands so as. Uh, um, so as not to uh, to forget about this event, um, and uh, and Priedor was also the uh, um, the site. It was an industrial town, and the large um, factories there, the industries there, were mining and uh, and steel. This uh, this sort of thing were turned into detention camps. So probably, um, if any of you have seen photos of. Uh, um, of detention camps, which were also centers for uh, um, for for torture and for killing from Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's probably from this camp that you see in the photo on the right, the uh, Omarska camp. The Ternopolje was a uh, um, was another camp where people were uh, um, were held and abused and uh, and and killed for a long time. Um, so the violence, regardless of the fact that the tribunal eventually declined to label it as genocide, is iconic. Um, the other thing that uh, I will say about Priedor, um, it is a town, the population, it is, it is mixed. Um, the, uh, the majority of, uh, of the town, the major majority of the population is Bosniak, or the group that used to be called Bosnian Muslims. But um, in terms of political control, it is in the territory of the um, Serb-dominated entity. Um, of the two entities that now make up Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, and the mayor of the town, Marko Boskic is his name, is the same person who was mayor of the town um, when people were told that they had to fly white flags and wear white armbands and were sent to these detention camps and, uh, um, and tortured and killed. Um, and one thing that I could tell you, most people would say that it is a good thing that industry has been revived in the town. The steel mill at Omarska, which was the campsite, has been revived um, thanks to an international investor, the Mittal Steel Corporation, um, which is based in, uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, so that site is now operating again as a steel mill. And uh, um, the official policy of the Mittal Steel Corporation is to forbid any kind of memorialization or commemoration on the site. They say this is a site where people do their work. And I think um, it might be possible for you to imagine people who were held as prisoners and abused in the site that was their workplace. Um, and then their workplace reopens and they are meant to go and work also in the site that was their, uh, their site of, of imprisonment. So it is the policy of the city it is the policy of these powerful internationals in the city, like Metal Steel, um, that there should be no public or official commemoration. Um, and since no permanent memorials exist, there are a 
lot of temporary exhibitions. Um, so what you see here is a group of people at the uh, um, um, at the end of a march, and they're in the main square in the center of uh, of Priador, in front of this uh, um, this building that was a department store, and they've gathered together to take a photograph. Um, that the photograph is also posing the question: Were the events that these people experienced genocide? Um, so this tension between the desire to keep life. Uh, active again, and the perception, at least on the part of people exercising political power, that this depends on the absence of memorialization has meant that any kind of act of memorialization is also going to be at the same time an act of, uh, of protest. Um, so I'll just describe to you what's in these photos here. I mean, the one on the left that you can see is obviously a protest. And the slogan on the banner in the uh, in the center, um, it means because uh, because it has to do with me, um, or because it relates to me. This is also the name of one of the groups of young activists in the city that uh, that organizes the protest. So they go around, and the name is uh, is also the uh, um, the slogan. And one of the objects of their protest is this. Uh, is this ban on memorialization. The photo on the right is from the same square that you saw in the photo on the uh, previous slide in front of the department store in the center of the city. And what somebody did here um, among the victims of, uh, um, of the large scale killings in Priador during the period of the war were 102 children. And what somebody has done here is they have taken 102 roses and they arrange them in a circle. And to the stem of each of the roses is attached a piece of paper with the name of, uh, of one of those 102 children. Um, now, this is a commemoration that the, uh, the city authorities banned. They said it would create disorder. They said, you're going to build this temporary monument and it is going to be, uh, to be destroyed. Uh, the person doing it did this anyway. Um, one of uh, the prominent residents and activists from Priador, um, Refi Kojic, filmed the entire incident. Uh, the memorial with the roses was left up for 24 hours, and he filmed it from very early in the morning to uh, um, when uh, when the roses were placed there and arranged to the time um, when uh, um, to the end of the day when everybody had gone to sleep. And during that time, nobody touched a single one of the roses, okay? So, I mean, we don't know who the people walking by were or what their experience of the war was, which side they were on, um, what their politics were, but they either walked respectfully around or they stopped to look at the roses, to read the names and to uh, to share memories with, uh, with one another um, so that the official policy of the city government that any kind of memorialization would be a danger, would be a threat to security, seems to be disproved um, both by the resistance of the citizens and by incidents like this, where uh, efforts at memorialization seem to have been treated with respect. Um, so let me stop talking about Priedra with this and stop the screen share. Um, I, I, I feel that I have some problems. You can see me, yeah? Uh, we we can hear you, but we can't see you. Okay. We um, can see you, but we can hear you. I uh, have no no idea as to why. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, thank you for this example. I think that it's and 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 the last uh, the last um, the last uh, uh, sentence that you have that how we can be. Uh, respectful for the memories and the experience, traumatic experience of people. And this is that what now, this is what uh, I really thinking about it, how we can be really inclusive to this traumatic experience and how we provide the space for, for sharing and commemorization. And uh, so I think that there, this is really, really, uh, good experience uh, that uh, that uh, that you can share uh, that you can share with us uh, and uh, what can I say that uh, today we also have um, 
uh, have uh, some tension and uh, uh, somehow the conflicts between uh, like local communities and authorities, uh, what's, what's need to be done and what, what can be preserved. And I think that it's, um, it's really important to tell about uh, Ukraine and Ukrainian communities that because of decentralization, uh, because uh, of the um, de democratic process that's going on in our country, and because of experience uh, uh, from experience of war and volunteering and activism from 2014, we get really strong um, grassroots. So we have a strong. Um, um, volunteer movement and we have uh, in, based on this uh, we have a strong strong civil society first of all of course in bigger cities in smaller cities it uh, it's not always working like this but in big cities we have this strong civil society that uh, that really has have power and can influence uh, on uh, on on local authorities uh, with this uh, um, with social movements, with protest movements, but also using uh, using the uh, the, the tools uh, for um, public participation, and uh, we have uh, really two, I think, really really good examples of uh, um, of 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 this. Um, um, of 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 this uh, good examples of uh, um, uh, of uh, right to the city based uh, uh, based on the examples of memorization. So we have two cases in in Kiev. We will see what will be the result. But in any cases, we have one case when the the the, the, the historical building was destroyed uh, uh, during an um, attack uh, from Russia and our mayor of uh, of, uh, of Kyiv city decided and told that this building can't be uh, reconstructed uh, renovated so we will destroy it and build something new in this place and uh, our local activists uh, they created uh, created the um, online petition and uh, in this petition, they saw that this is our heritage, and uh, it uh, need to be uh, um, it need to be preserved, and we need uh, to reconstruct uh, this building, not destroying, but reconstruct. First of all, to have expertise. If we really, uh, uh, if it's really in bad condition, and we can't reconstruct it, but if we can, we need to reconstruct it. And for uh, for one week, uh, this uh, uh, this um, uh, this uh, petition was uh, so popular that people vote for this for this decision. Yeah, and it's now it's mean that mayor need to, to somehow to deal with this. So what what I would would like I said that we really have uh, um, impressive people in our communities that uh, that can um, that have really have power maybe they not always uh, um, uh, uh, recognize it or but they re really can influence on decision making uh, and the other example is uh, the memorization of Roman Ratoshny um, uh, he was a local activist in Kiev uh, he was a young uh, young man but really active man and he fighting uh, for um, preserving uh, of um, a uh, green area uh, in uh, in Kiev, uh, preserving um, uh, this area, and he would like to have a park in this area. And there was, um, I think that like the conflict was like for two years, yeah, with with Hermadas and invent investors who would like to 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 build uh, um, to build houses there. And uh, it was no, uh, no, um, it, so it was, the conflict was frozen, no decision. And um, um, yeah. after 24th of February, Roman Tratoshny, he went uh, to army and uh, unfortunately he died. And uh, local community of Kyiv, uh, the community of activists, um, they, uh, they, 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 they uh, create, uh, create uh, the petition of memorization uh, of uh, Roman Ratoshny. And now we have like 
two decisions. First of all, on this place, um, which he fight for, will be the will be the park, will be the green zone. And the second, we get the street of Roman Ratushne uh, in Kyiv. And I think that is also a good example that shows that our communities, our active people, they can really make a lot of efforts uh, to make uh, things uh, to be done and they can influence uh, on, uh, on, on local authorities uh, in, in this case and in others. And uh, why I'm talking about this now is that... Uh, uh, what I think that um, if we can influence on um, international projects of supporting Ukraine, I think that it's also um, important that our grassroots need to be uh, support and empowered because now um, a lot of people, uh, active people volunteering and a lot of people, um, they um, are they they fighting for our independence, but on the other other hand, they have uh, now they have lack of uh, resources for surviving, and now they have like two uh, two wars. First of all, it's a war with uh, Russia, but other war is still for preventing uh, and fighting for 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 their for their for their. Um, communities, neighborhoods, and preventing it from, uh, from development and also um, for, for, for develop, for still making their projects uh, in our cities. Yeah, so what, what, this is what your example makes me to think about. First of all, that we really have uh, great, uh, great uh, local activists and local communities that, 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 that uh, are active. And uh, what I think that in, in our gramadas, uh, mm, uh, the, the, the social movements uh, really, really have uh, impact uh, on, on, on local authorities from, from time to time. Yeah. And if I may add, it was a, a, a positive, extremely positive uh, example of renaming the street in Kiev because other examples were not um, it was like uh, um, voting by your cell phone or something, but uh, people were not, uh, didn't share the common vision of uh, new renaming. But this uh, was uh, supported by the majority, absolute, ma absolute majority. And this was, I think it was a very successful case of renaming because people understood uh, why the street should be renamed and uh, in which way and actually uh, the new name they accepted without any conflicts or any resistance from other members of the community. So it was really a great example. Um, perhaps we could get to the next case if we do have. Uh, sure, yeah, I've, I've mm -hmm. got only one more. And this one is uh, is relatively shorter, um, so yeah. let me. Uh, um, so yes, our next stop is uh, um, is Belgrade, the the capital of Serbia, um, and the building that you see here is the bombed out remains of the headquarters of the general staff of the uh, um, of the Yugoslav army. Um, which was bombed by NATO in 1999. Um, so this is a building where, you know, on the one hand, you can say the headquarters of the general staff of the military, this is a legitimate military target. Um, it was legal for, uh, for NATO to, uh, um, to, to, bomb, to bomb this building um, as awful as, uh, as this destruction looks. On the other hand, um, you can imagine the effect that this bombing has on the city. This is a uh, this is a building. It's very very large. It's actually two buildings that are sort of mirror images of each other, um, right on opposite sides of the street. Um, so a very visible icon of a of a portion of the city, and it's a central portion of the city. I mean, it's about a twenty minute walk from. Uh, um, from the place that we live when we're in Belgrade. It's uh, just a short way down the street from the best falafel place in uh, Belgrade. And it is also an architecturally 
significant building. Um, it was uh, it was designed in 1957. Construction was completed in 1965 by uh, um, Nikola Dobrovich, who is a major uh, Yugoslav modernist uh, architect. The design was meant with the two buildings on opposite sides of the street um, to uh, to resemble the valley of the Sutiska River, which was a uh, um, the site of one of the main battles of the uh, of the Second World War. Um, so this is standing in a prominent place and the damage is visible and there has been ongoing debate about what to do with this enormous damaged building. Um, should it be left alone? Should there be an attempt to rebuild it? Should there be an attempt to re um, to rebuild it, but uh, um, but with another purpose to try to turn it into a large hotel or uh, um, or or something like this. Eventually, a decision was made by the city government to give the building a status the status of a historical monument. And what the status of a historical monument means um, is that anybody who does rebuild it has to rebuild it in a way that is respectful of the original design by Nikola Dobrovich. That is either to reproduce the design or to integrate elements of the design into anything that's built. Um, and maybe what I should say, I mean, these are buildings that are really very large. So there are not very many investors in the world who have uh, the resources to do anything at all with them. Um, I mean, other than than simply demolish them and build something else on the spot, um, which is something that is opposed by many people in the city because they regard it as uh, um, as as their own monument of war. Um, so uh, um, so this is a site that uh, I mean, it looks now very similar to the way that it did on the day that it was bombed. Um, little has been done with it, and it is a site of ongoing dispute and discussion and debate. There is no resolution about what to do with it, but it's very prominent in public memory. And the only thing that I will say is that this is a, a monument of destruction from the most recent set of wars that Serbia was in, um, and other monuments do not get the same level of attention um, so the photos that I am showing now, this is a site that was an important site in um, in the genocides that were carried out during the Second World War by the Nazis and the uh, um, collaborationists in uh, in Serbia. There were two sites in Serbia where um, uh, where Jewish residents of uh, um, of the city were gathered together. Um, and would eventually be killed. About 90% of that population was uh, was killed during the period of the Second World War. Um, the second of them, I'm not showing you. It was uh, operated for a longer time. That is the old fairgrounds on the other side of the uh, um, of the Sava River. That actually is being turned into a memorial site. Um, but this is a decision that was made a very short time ago. It took 70 years of campaigning to get that turned into a memorial site. The Topovske Stupe site um, is uh, is also uh, in the center of uh, of the city. It was only in operation for about four months in uh, in 1941. But this is a place where people were arrested. They were held there, and this is before the time that the uh, um, the Nazis and the collaborators were sending people to camps to be killed. They were doing the killing locally. Okay, so it was a place where people were held as prisoners and if they were taken out of there they were taken out in order to be killed in the photo on the left you can see that there is a memorial plaque that has in several languages um, a uh, um, a description of what the site was used for this is the second memorial plaque to uh, um, to be put up on the site this was put up about uh, three four years ago the previous plaque was uh, was vandalized and and eventually destroyed uh, I would say most residents of the city do not know about this site and its purpose. And you might get an indication from that. I think that this photo on the right is from 2019. It's relatively recent. Um, and you can see the site operating as a garden center. People are invited to go there as a place where they can play paintball. Um, it began to be the object of public campaigns just over the last two years after a large real estate business in the region um, put out a proposal to convert the site into a shopping mall. And I will say they 
did in their plan make a provision to set aside a portion of the site as a memorial site in the shopping mall that they were going to uh, to build. Um, but it nonetheless became an object of, of protest. And now there is a campaign also to turn this into a memorial site. Um, so these are instances of dispute, delay, and forgetting. Um, and let me take away the, um, the slides again. Yeah, thank you very much. I I just would like to um, uh, what watching on the on on, on our timing. Um, I just would like uh, to ask uh, maybe somebody from Maui, our audience, would like uh, to comment. Uh, I'm, I'm worrying about about timing. <laughs> Starting worrying about this. I think it was, you know, too too much information to think about, and uh, I will just come up with a remark about the building of this Minister of Defense. We have not only the same case in Kharkiv with this Oblast administration building, which it was destroyed during the first days of the war, uh, and now and since then people started to discuss what to do with the building, whether to reconstruct it because it like uh, uh, Stalin's uh, Stalinist classicism of the 50s of the 1950s and it uh, housed uh, the Communist Party headquarters or something like that and then it became the Oblast administration building. Uh, so and um, I think uh, I'm, I'm I will be watching uh, of uh, for how this debate will end up. It's in, to me it's an interesting story to follow. Yeah, and uh, Francesca, uh, perhaps you yeah. have something to say. Oh no, yeah, actually, I uh, um, was uh, really fascinated by the conversation today i think that you both did a great job in uh, in uh, discussing uh, in uh, in discussing past solution and past uh, issues of reconstruction uh, connecting this past solution to con to contemporary war to ukrainian war uh, so thank you Ari, for selecting uh, three four uh, cases that we all know very well but that were, were very you very effectively uh, uh, picked up for uh, examples that uh, show all the different problems that can arise uh, during uh, reconstruction. And Maria, you also, you did a great job in, uh, in uh, connecting this to contemporaneity. I was just, uh, I have just, uh, I did some research of more or less all of the, 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 the sites you have mentioned, Eric. So uh, I have some questions for you because you, you, you are, more expert than me and you you you've been boot on the ground for many times in the western balkans for many for many years and uh, for example about Vyacheslav, uh, that of course uh, it's uh, i completely agree with your presentation but uh, i remember a question during the discussion by katerina she was asking uh, what happened in the meantime uh, before uh, from destruction to reconstruction, because a lot of time passed, you know? And it's interesting, I think, that uh, in the meantime, I was in Sarajevo, for example, for my field work in uh, 2008, and then later uh, many times. In the, mean, in the meantime, that uh, uh, ruin became a monument. and became a monument in a situation in which we were discussing this topic uh, last time with Alexander and Elisa. Um, uh, uh, in, in that period, uh, that became uh, the Vietnamese became an anti sub memorial. I don't know, this is what I'm asking you because I remember there was a plaque saying uh, this building was uh, damaged, uh, it's, it's uh, in the condition you see now because of the Serbian aggressor, blah, blah, blah. And this plaque was uh, long, uh, um, for a long time, it was discussed and contested. There were a lot of discussion. On better than me, uh, all the discussion about that plague. I, I don't remember right now uh, if, if there is still uh, a plague. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that, it's, that it's still there, but, uh, okay. but, it, but it's, also still, it's also still debated. You know, this question about how 
perpetrators are identified or about how in these short descriptions, uh, you know, a characterization of the situation overall is given. And this is always really intensely contested still. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so this uh, somehow answers to the question of some of you, if uh, reconstruction can, can be, uh, let's say, carried on without uh, the issue of memorization. Of course not, of course, this, this is kind of impossible because any formal reconstruction will anyhow repropose and uh, a sort of rewriting of what we are reconstructing. So there is no innocent and no neutral um, reconstruction. This is something that uh, should be, let's say, uh, our point of departure for any, re uh, any, any reasoning that we are going to do next. And, uh, and thank you also to the General Stab, uh, the, 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 uh, in a headquarter in Belgrade. That's a very interesting example because it's actually the, the same. You know, as Vietnica, Gerrashta has been used in Belgrade as a sort of natural monument, I would say, borrowing the expression from Sebab, the natural history of destruction of Dresden. We have this uh, naturally, this monument, and we use this as a kind of, pot um, of uh, potential reservoir memory that we are not doing anything. We are not taking our responsibility about telling a story about the past, about what, what happened, but we have this potential, this semantic potential of memory that if somebody wants to use this potential can do that. And it happened because uh, so, uh, during um, uh, some period that uh, ruin in uh, of Gerrashtab became a kind of symbol of the NATO aggression and so of the anti-NATO feelings of Belgrade against uh, the Western aggressor and so on. So uh, th that's a uh, thank you again for the selection of these case studies that show how the, the complexity and the continuum of possibility that are uh, involved in the situation. And so here. Thank you. Masha, you, you have something to say? Thank you, Francesca. Yeah, I, I just, uh, that's, what, that's what I would like to say that uh, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to have a talk. And I think that it was a um, really important talk. Uh, first of all, uh, um, it's opportunity to, to, to think about our reality now and our future based on, on, on uh, on, on experience of your research, but on the other hand, I think that we have a good conversation with the uh, with the uh, with the uh, four of us: uh, Eric, uh, Svetlana, Maria, and, uh, and Katerina. Because uh -huh. unfortunately, she yeah. Has yeah leave. so uh, but but i think that it was really crucial uh, uh, her role in this and this is nice that she would like uh, to join us today well well thank you it's really yeah. it's really a pleasure thanks very much thank you thank you yeah we are so much concentrated now on ourselves on our problems and told that we perhaps sometimes you know we oversee uh, other examples or as other people's um, experiences and it's important to 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 have it and to have this perspective so thank you so much hi goran thank you everyone for, for joining to our talk today it's uh, i agree that it was very fascinating and important dialogue between some past and nowadays and it's important to uh, just to talk about uh, all these uh, aspects in order to find solution, because uh, if we don't talk, so uh, uh, it's like nothing of what uh, we can to discuss. Uh, and uh, also, I uh, remind that uh, this event is recorded, so everything will be saved on Nama YouTube page. And thank you again for joining and. Uh, Wish you a, a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, too. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks a lot. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. It was amazing, I must say. Thank, thank you. you.